champions. I'm Amy Morgan, the feature writer for the San Antonio Marriage Initiative. I am just so delighted today to introduce you to Jim Burns. Jim is the president of the Ministry Homeward. He has close to 2 million resources in 20 languages and speaks to thousands of people across the world each year on the values of Homeward. Strong marriages, confident parents, empowered kids, and healthy leaders. Some of his most popular books are Confident Parenting, The Purity Code, Creating an Intimate Marriage, Closer, and Doing Life with Your Adult Children. His new book, The Empty Nest, is coming out this spring. Jim and his wife, Kathy, have raised three grown daughters. Jim, thank you so much for being here. Amy, it is so great to be with you. And I just, uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. We've had conversations before and I just, I, I just enjoy it so much. Oh, me too. This is just such a treat. Well, we're going to get a sneak peek into your book, The Empty Nest, but I want to start with your parenting adult children. I, my boys are 22 and 24, so this is a subject near and dear to my heart. Right, right. Yeah, and even when they're 22 and 24, you go, wait, I think they're adults. They want us to treat them like adults, but they're not always acting like adults. Now, maybe your boys are like that. My girls at 22 and 24, they'd say, I'm an adult. You know, treat me like an adult. And I think, wait, I'm still paying for your cell phone. We're still paying for some college stuff, you know, and on and on. But yeah, it's 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 not easy. It's complicated. Well, and and I think where, where we're coming to is this with this adult children part, your adult children can really have an impact on your marriage. Yes. And I mean, this is something, you know, we're talking to a lot of the, the, our marriage champions and our church leaders. Yeah. I mean, this is what's sitting in your pews right now. And this is, you know, you really have some resources here that can provide some insight and help. Yeah. Well, you're right. It's, you know, it's both for parenting, but it is for marriage. I mean, you can't, you can't just Cut the, I mean, they're the same in many ways. And you go through such a, a, a change. It's a rite of passage that none of us ever were prepared for in our marriage or with kids. I mean, you invested two decades of your life with your kids. You maybe buried some things with your marriage because you were trying to get those kids launched into adulthood and be somewhat responsible. All of a sudden you wake up one day and you say, wait, I'm not as needed anymore. You know, my whole um, job description, my DNA. And then you look at your spouse and go, wow, We've buried some things. A lot of a lot of us do that. We've buried some things, or we were child focused with our with our marriage, and so we weren't putting as much energy into it. And so, you know, we really do have to do a lot of the word I use a lot is reinvent. We not only have to reinvent the relationship with our adult children and begin to treat them like adults, even if they're not acting always like it, but we also have to reinvent the marriage. And and really, for many people, it's reinvent your entire life because you're like, wow, my what do I do now? You know, because we had put so much time with those kids. And, you know, we we even miss the mess. We miss the drama. We miss, you know, driving and all that. And we look up and say, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? That has to do with the empty nest. But it also has to do with, you know, just our kids going through that. We're not as needed as we used to be. Well, and you have some real good direction, you know, with the adult children book yeah. about, you know, some boundaries to like, do you want to kind of give us kind of your, your game plan a little bit, just touch yeah. on some of the things? Sure. I mean, just real quickly, I'd say, and I say this to parents and they, I think sometimes they laugh and sometimes they're aghast that I said it, but you're fired. You know, you're fired as a day-to-day -day parent. Um, and, and you are, I mean, you're, if you aren't, firing yourself, your kids are going to fire you because they're moving from dependence on you to independence. And so, you know, that's not the worst thing. Our role has to change. And if we keep trying to like the, the, with the book, doing life with your adult children, it says, keep your mouth shut and the welcome mat out. Well, that's hard. I mean, I've got scars on my tongue from needing to bite my tongue. And, you know, Kathy and I will sometimes look at each other and just go, like this because we have good advice or we we still want to treat them like they were you know young and they they jump into that i watch my kids they come into the house they're all now married we had one married last week so the last one and um they come into that they open the refrigerator they make comments about what we don't have in terms of good food anymore <laughs> i do the same thing i'm like yeah, I mean, it's just it, it cracks me up but we still have to you know we have to rewrite what i like to say is we rewrite the script and part of that is not giving advice. In fact, one of the principles is unsolicited advice is usually taken as criticism. And I think that shocked me because, you know, I'll give advice to my kids and I'll and they'll go, not now, dad. And I'll kind of go, wait, I, I get paid to give people advice. Give me a break here. You know, I've got some great advice. Why do you need to go to Europe to find yourself? I have all the answers right here. You know, we could do a lot cheaper. You know what I'm saying? But 
the fact is, is experience is a better teacher than advice. And as parents, we have to learn that. And that, that's an important aspect of, you know, doing the adult children thing. But again, it mixes because, you know, the average person and everybody's different. And, and our family, we boomeranged with kids coming, doing empty nest and then kids coming back and, you know, back and forth. But the average person uh, becomes em an empty nester at, at 48 years, 0.9 or whatever months. Well, you know, you've got, you might be in the empty nest longer than you were with your kids. And yet, when you think about it, especially when you have 22 and 24 year olds and that, you know, more in that age range, you go, it has there been, is there another life out there? I mean, for me, and, and again, we have to do that back to that idea of reinventing. And so we do with our adult kids, we have to set up boundaries, but we even have to learn to do that with our, with our spouses too, in terms of boundaries, boundaries are not good or bad boundaries help. So a boundary might be, we're going to do a weekly date night. We got away from it when the kids were in high school to now we are on the weekly date night thing. And there's no excuses, you know, because it's going to, I found as we got into the empty nest that we would fill it quickly. So like Kathy filled it with, you know, an extra Bible study and uh, Kathy went back to school, went back and was teaching and I filled it with more work and all this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden we look up and we go, guy, we're just as busy. Not a smart idea. It was actually what we needed to do was declutter and sort of reinvent and say to each other, what do we want this relationship to look like? That doesn't mean that we don't have a relationship with the kids. They, they keep showing up and we keep going to see them and, and, you know, that's good. But what do we want our marriage to look like? And in a sense, the empty nest gives us a chance to rekindle the love, if you would, to, I mean, you falling in love is easy. Staying in love is harder. So how do you, how do you do the, the disciplines, if you would, the intentionality to make your marriage strong? Cause you know, it's not going to, it's not going to just all of a sudden, you know, people would ask me and I always laughed at this. They'd go, so now that you guys are in the empty nest, you're probably just running around chasing each other. And I go, well, actually we're not. <laughs> and maybe there are people, I want to find those people. What's their secret? <laughs> but we had to be much more disciplined about, you know, those connection times, but it was easier to do, frankly, um, because we had more time. I mean, all the time we were spending with the kids from, you know, going to games to, you know, driving here or having parties at the house and all that, that, that disappeared. So you're either going to fill it with other stuff or you can fill it with some, you know, better things for your marriage. Yeah. Well, I, I, you were generous and gave me an advanced copy. So I've had the yeah. opportunity to preview your draft. You might be one of the um, first people to, to read that. That's oh, awesome. I'm so honored. Oh, anyway, but you really, you did, you used a word about, the, you mentioned that about the, your second half of life and you used a word and I'm trying to look, I know I wrote it down. It was, um, the second, it wasn't the second quarter, the second half, maybe? Second half, you're talking about sports. It's a sports illustration. Of course, most people who read Empty Nest will be, a, will be women, but the, you know, so I'm giving a sports illustration. But, you know, the second half, can you win the game in the second half, not in the first half. I mean, you got to do all the right things in the first half, or you're not going to get to the second half to even be a contender, say, in sports. But you win in the second half. Yeah. And so, you know, the marriage, like I can honestly say, and we, Kathy and I have been married 47 years, but I can honestly say that we have a better marriage today than we did before. Um, and with kids, as I, we'd never want to change this, of course, but, you know, we had more conflict when the kids were in the house. You know, we just, because there was drama and there was wet towels everywhere and there was, you know, this and that. We, we made a conscious decision to spend more time together to actually, um, you know, take time out of our, our schedule and, and connect, you know, even when with spiritual intimacy, you know, I think the least developed area uh, of intimacy oftentimes is spiritual intimacy, even with Christians. So Kathy and I, here we are both Christians, both in ministry, both, you know, doing lots of things with people, but not as spiritually connected as we wanted. I mean, we would pray together periodically. I mean, we speak together on marriage. I mean, so yeah, we do stuff, but then we started spending more time together in, you know, kind of studying together, studying the scripture together or reading together. And you know what, that Amy, that was a, a game changer. And I, I mean, I want people to do that when they're, you know, in like my, I have children, one of my daughters has a six-year-old and a three-year-old. That's hard for them to find that time. I get that. So if they could just do it once a, a week, awesome. Kathy and I can do it more than once a week because we have more of that time, but we're not sitting around, you know, at the kitchen table going, you know, why don't the kids call? We're busy. We're doing stuff, but we want to make sure that some of that 
decluttering of life gets focused on, you know, connecting with each other and it works. I mean, it really does work. I mean, you can, you can fall in love again, not that we were not in love, but we really have had a, a new, um, you know, experience in our, in our marriage uh, as we've gotten older in a, in a cool way. I mean, it doesn't look like it was when we first got married, not at all, but it, but it's, it's great because, but I think it's because Kathy's putting in energy. I'm trying to put in energy and um, you know, pretty much it works. Although a couple of days ago we had a big disagreement and she just went through cancer surgery and she goes, Jim, I had cancer. And I went, I'm never going to win a, an argument again in my life. Cause she just, she pulled the cancer card on me, which she's now doing okay. But you know, I'm going, give me a break. That's not fair. You know, that's not fair conflict uh, resolution. I'll just tell you right now, but I'm just complaining about my wife for a moment. Well, you know what? That is encouraging to us because if somebody with your your chops can still have to work through some conflict yeah. with with your wife in a loving and appropriate manner, yeah. I think that gives us all encouragement. Well, yeah, we, I mean, we we all have high maintenance marriages, and you know, Kathy and I weren't raised in the church, so we became we were first generation Christians, and when we we had the mistake of thinking that because we were Christians and we'd gone to a Christian school and we got married and we're both going into ministry that everything was going to be good and it wasn't. We brought our dysfunctions with us. So we realized that our life is being what we call the transitional generation. The Bible says that you inherit the sins of a previous generation to the third and fourth generation. So, I mean, I wasn't doing the weirdest stuff that my parents were doing and she wasn't doing the weirdest stuff hers were, but we sure had that baggage. So about a year, about a year into it, we decided to either recover or repeat. So we're going to have to break the chain. And I think that's what parents can see about their kids, but they can also see it in a marriage that, you know, you can recover. Is it ever perfect? No, don't expect that. You know, we have a phrase, I know I should quote the Bible, but I'm quoting Disney, Lilo and Stitch, love it. Um, this is my family. It may be small, it may be broken, but it's still good. And I think sometimes we can look at our our own lives and say, yeah, we have some brokenness in our life. And you know what? It's still good. We can work through this and it's going to be better. It's it's three steps forward and only now one step back, you know, for the day. Yeah. Well, and you know, you were just mentioning that spiritual intimacy that you've had yeah. the time now in the empty nest to develop with Kathy. Yeah. You wrote some books about that, books yeah. that people who are watching might be interested in using for yeah. their Sunday school class. Well, yeah. tell us a little bit about those. Well, you know, one of the books is called Creating an Intimate Marriage. And I kind of laugh when you say Sunday school class because people do it in a class. We have a course out at Homeward that does this. And they'll the the women get it. It's on connection because intimacy means connection. The men are going, is this guy going to only talk to us about sex? Because in their mind, intimacy and sex. Well, you know, there's chapter on sexuality, but, you know, nobody sent us to marriage school. Um, we either, like for us, we kind of said, that's what our parents did. We're not going to follow that. And others go, no, that's what our parents did. We're going to follow some of that. But, but you know, this, I tell people, read a marriage book a year. Read a parenting book a year. And so creating it into marriage. We also have a book called Closer, which was the book we never dreamed we would write together. Um, but it's just, it's 52 experiences where we challenge people to spend 20 minutes a week. Not a day, but a week. And that was the life changer for us because... Uh, some mentors of us, we had to be with marriage mentors all the time. So we would kind of go find people. We never really told them they were our mentors. We just started hanging out with them and, you know, whatever. And, you know, they said they spent 20 minutes a week and we're pulling out of the driveway and Kathy goes, I want that 20 minute thing. And, um, and so we started doing it. I mean, I, I, I could do 20 minutes. I, I wasn't sure I wanted another, I said, I don't want another Bible study and I don't want this and that. And I sound so unspiritual, but, but you know what? It was really good because we connected. And I think some of the anointing in our marriages or with our parenting or in our ministry comes from those moments of, of time. I don't remember what I ate two weeks ago, but it nursed me for the day. And so sometimes I don't remember what Kathy and I did with our, with our closer time, what we call our closer time, but the book closer has a scripture, a story, and then some faith conversations. And uh, it's really a neat experience. People hardly ever say, I love what you wrote in the book, which is not good for an author, but they go, the 20 minutes has changed our marriage. And that's awesome. So the book's called Closer. It's one of the better selling marriage devotionals in the country. And it always uh, shocks us because we didn't do it out of the big strength in our life. We did it out of, you know, what we've been learning. We were kind of just, you know, excited about some of it. And so the contents, I think the content's good, but it's the 20 minutes. They don't need the book. 
Well, and in that finding the 20 minutes, let's go back to the empty nest book because you really kind of have a step. You talk about, you know, coping with this new identity. And then there was a part that I really liked about saying, you know, your child when your child leaves home and their life fills up with fresh experiences, follow their lead. Oh, I know. That really know. inspired me. I liked that. Yeah. You know, I think my first phrase on that was when your kids fill their life and you're not needed as much, you know, go find something else to do. And that I liked how we phrased it, you know, better. But yeah, you know what? Your kids are they're they're having new experiences. They're doing new and we need to rejoice in that. Sometimes some of those new experiences aren't what we want them to be doing, to be honest. You know, at that age, they're still going through the experimental phase. But we also need to fill up our life with new experiences. And so that's when people can, you know, do some hobbies together or you know, get involved more at church uh, and on the marriage team and your marriage mentoring. And you go, guy, we never thought we'd be marriage mentors, but nobody is perfect. So, you know, people need authenticity more than they need somebody to go, yeah, our marriage is perfect. We've never had an argument in our life. Seriously, I can't relate to that. See what I'm saying? So, you know, this is the time for us to fill our lives with new experiences that can be really healthy. And because we're older, when we're younger and just married, you're just trying to get it through the day. I mean, I remember when our kids were young, I'd go, whoa, we made it through Thursday. And then we go, oh, wait, Friday, we got to start this all over again. You know what I mean? But now we can be more proactive and intentional about saying, why don't we spend 20 minutes a week? Why don't we try to go on four, even if they're one night trips away, some outings together? Uh, I just talked to a couple and it's actually in the Empty Nets book. Um, it just barely squeezed in, but I talked to a couple who they love coffee. And so their goal was to find 27 coffee shops in Iowa of all places. Sometimes it takes them four hours to drive to some coffee shops. So it's not about the coffee, it's about the connection, but they can do that in the Empty Nest, even though they're both you know really busy people, but they're finding that kind of time. How cool, how cool is that? So you can do other things, but you've got to, it has to be a, a choice. It's a, it's a decision you make, you know, nobody, comes to a marriage and has a perfect marriage or has a, a an easy marriage. I mean, a sinner marries another sinner and you have sinnerlings <laughs> and, and, and you just, you know, are going to bump into each other. We've got to be more proactive about it. It sounds so unromantic, I know, and it sounds so not spontaneous, but it works. Well, and I, I liked, I, I love that coffee because my, my husband and I are big coffee drinkers. So I love the coffee date, uh, yeah. that illustration. But, you know, you talked too about filling up with, the wrong things. And yeah. there's a, a part in there you talked about decluttering. Yeah. Right, I like right. that too. Yeah. Well, you know, we looked at our life and said, wow, we got a lot of clutter going on. And I actually looked at some, uh, some, you know, kind of cool things that I was doing uh, in terms of some boards and things like that, that it was time for me to declutter even some of the busyness of my life. And uh, you know what? I can honestly say that by me doing some of the decluttering in my own life, just as a personal thing, not just talking about Kathy's. Um, but that was really helpful to me. You know, there's a word in the English language, actually uh, in San Antonio, most of them know it in Spanish too. It's the word no. In Spanish, <laughs> no. And sometimes we just have to say that. You know, Kathy used to say to me all the time, we have a Messiah, he's doing very well, don't replace him. But I say that to soccer moms all the time. You know, you know, they're they're just trying to do so much. Sometimes we just have to honestly declutter so that we can put aside something that's you know been a part of our life, so we can have a you know a new moment, a new experience. The Bible talks a lot about breakthroughs and new new moments and having a fresh you know experience, not only with God but with each other. And to do that, sometimes you have to first declutter, and uh, and it's hard to declutter. I mean, you know, I, I talk about in the book that. There was this Hawaiian flowered shirt that I hadn't worn for several years. And Kathy's like, hey, you get rid of the shirt. And I'm like, no, that, that has meaning. She goes, well, it has so much meaning. Why don't you wear it? And um, I decluttered. And guess what? I, I haven't really thought much about that Hawaiian shirt since then. And it kind of looked goofy anyway, most likely. But hey, there you go. Um, so what what is so it's, it's sometimes decluttering in the house, the closets, the garage, things like that. But it's also decluttering our life. You know, what is it that we're doing right now that in the empty nest we may not need to do? I was on a board that was great, but I, I wasn't as needed. I was needed at the beginning for that board. So when I pulled off the board, I said, I, I said to their leader, I said, you have me 24-7. I mean, I am I'm yours, but I'm just not going to go to those board meetings. And for me, that meant getting on a plane and flying someplace. And you know what? 
they they don't miss they don't miss me. And you know what? I have more time now because I and yet I still connect with the board. Kathy and I still give to this ministry. We still are, you know, part of it in, in many ways. But the time factor can be focused on something else that for me right now is more important. That doesn't mean that it wasn't important when I was on that on that board. But so I think you you find those kinds of things. Some people will go back to school. Some moms who've done this, and you know, I know a woman who went and got her degree in uh, marriage and family counseling, and uh, and then didn't uh, start a private practice, but at their church, she does. She handles the marriage ministry at their church, and she's she's killing it. They've got marriage mentors, and it's a church I speak at quite a bit. It's a very large church. She does it for free. They don't need the money, so she's doing this incredible thing for free, but she's doing it with a a master's degree in marriage and family because she went back and did that. How great for her. She found the time and her husband, you know, you know, was excited about that. You know, you mentioned too, as we were talking about the soccer mom stopping and you talk back to the, the, uh, your parenting, the adult children landing the helicopter. I know I'm going through that book yeah. and you have also have some video resources with that. Yeah. I'm doing that with a group of, of ladies, just personally of, of prayer yeah. group. And I, I know we just were talking about that just yesterday about are, do we still, are we still in the helicopter? What would landing it look like? What is, what would we have to let go yeah. of? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, part of it is, are we enabling dependency? Yeah. Because what happens is we want our kids still sometimes to depend on us. And, um, and that's not good because really the bottom line in parenting and, and at Homeward, we, we speak to all ages of parents. And so this happens to be adult children, but you know, even with young parents who have young children, I always say the bottom line isn't to raise obedient kids. It's to actually raise responsible adults. And I'm going to add who love God. Well, to do that, that's how we land the helicopter. You don't land the helicopter. You know, my little James, my, my grandson, we're not landing the helicopter at six to say, go play out on the street or go over to the mall or go. He's a surfer at six, believe it or not. We live in California and, uh, you know, just go surfing by yourself. Of course not. But as time goes on, he's going to get more freedom. And so the question for your prayer group is, is there anything where we're still enabling dependency on them? And that's our problem, not as much their problem, because they want they want to experience freedom. Now, I mean, they're going to come back. They're going to they're not they don't know how to do this adult child thing perfectly e either. But I think it's really important that 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 for me is the question when you talk about landing the helicopter. And people sometimes will say to me, I, you know, I actually thought I had landed this helicopter. I'm not landing the helicopter. I'm still paying for this. I'm still doing that. I'm still, you know, we were totally involved in some of the money things. I still have my opinions. It's like the lady who said to her 45 year old, um, you know, honey, it's cold outside. Put on your coat. And the 45 year old who was a major vice president of a Silicon Valley uh, software company that we would all know. I mean, it's huge, it's massive. And she goes, you know, mom, I'm, I'm pretty well decided that I could probably decide if I'm going to put on my coat or not. And, you know, she said, put on your coat. I'm your mother. Well, what she needed to do was probably bite her tongue. And if her daughter was going to be cold walking outside, she's going to be cold walking outside. But that that's something that the mom needed to work through. No, well, right. you give an illustration in the book too about a couple that comes in with their son. I think it's yeah, and and John. yes, and right. and you were saying and and that he it was obviously a big situation, but it was causing so much conflict right. between the couple. And you know, we talked about gray divorce. You know, that's the only yep. demographic that's rising. Yes. Um, Yes, it is. And it's partly because of the Sean. So Sean's story is that he was he'd come back from school, did you know, got good grades at UCLA. So, you know, smart kid. He was actually sitting on this couch right here. You can see that couch yeah. kind of with his arms like this. He's thinking life's great because the parents are paying for everything and he's sleeping in the mom. He Sean had decided to be a vegan. So the mom cooked for, you know, them and then cooked a vegan meal. I mean, seriously. So they're saying, you know, Sean's not doing anything. He sleeps until one. He's playing video games. He stays out late at night. He smokes pot. And Sean's just kind of like, hey, I've got a great life. They And they go, Sean has a problem. And I said, no, you have a problem because they were conflicting over this. Yeah. And what they needed to do was allow Sean to become a responsible adult by taking away the credit card that was paying for actually all of his stuff. I don't know how he's getting his pot, but the but the credit card was paying for everything else, right? So the point being, and then by the way, Sean went, he went from liking me until not really liking me when I said, no, you 
you have the problem. Sean has a great life in his mind. So that when the parents came together to then they did it. They I followed these. I know these people. They did a really good job. And guess what? It enhanced their marriage. It built their relationship better because ah, that son, they finally launched their son to adulthood. And it wasn't easy. It was bumpy. And Sean probably still isn't the perfect, you know, specimen of a you know adult child. But you got to do that. You know, and, and part of that was landing the helicopter. And that's hard. It was really hard for the mom because she even said, well, what if he becomes homeless? And I'm, I'm thinking about these people who actually had some fa financial capacity and all that kind of stuff. I I'm not thinking Sean's a really sharp guy. He, he, he might sleep on somebody's couch for a couple of months, but he's not going to become, you know, homeless. And, you know, that's where tough love comes in. Tough love isn't, and I, and parents sometimes will disagree on this. So that's where it hurts the marriage, but tough love isn't being mean. Tough love is allowing the consequences of poor decisions to carry out. That's tough love. And so, you know, if Sean's not going to get a job, then he's not going to, you know, be able to eat his vegan meals someplace. And the mom seriously should teach, let him even buy it's stuff. It's in the house, fantastic. Buy whatever that is that he needs, but he should be cooking that, not, not her for two, you know, two different meals. Well, I really like to, and, and, and our group has found so applicable, you know, you have some steps you have that can really kind of, like you said, kind of get you out of that marital yeah. complex in the empty nest and move forward to a path. You even had one like setting up a contract, you yeah. know, with you and your husband being on the page then yes. together to help get the kid on the page that right. reduces that. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, it, it seems to me that one of the best things we can do is actually try to get on. Same, we'll never get on the same page 100 percent as parents. Um, the reason is because we're both, you know, human beings. But if we can get as much on my most of the time, I find that parents are about at least 80 percent. So get together on that contract with the son or the daughter and not only present some ideas. Here's what we expect. Here's what we'll do. Here's what we expect you to do. But also, what what do you want? Because that was the big shock for us. We ask. Our daughter Becca, when she moved back in, after to get, she wanted to get her master's. She needed a place to stay. It was going to be cheap. We went as long as you're getting your master's degree, you are in the house. You're our roomie. Um, but I, I so, but we came with a contract. And then Becca, I said, do you just on the spur of the moment? I said, Becca, do you have anything? Yeah, I do. If I bring friends over, Dad, I don't want you to sit in the middle of the couch and just talk with all my friends because I just, I'm a youth pastor at heart. So I, she goes. Um, uh, I, I need some privacy. Um, I'm willing to spend two nights for dinner with you guys, but don't think I'm going to spend the whole night, you know, now just hanging out with you guys. I'll do dinner. And if I want to go see my friends, I will. She had all these things. They were really good, Amy. They were really good things. So don't, so create a contract, but also listen to what they have to say. And uh, when you do that, it really helps the relationship. But what I'd say is it really helped Kathy's my relationship because we talked contract first. And Kathy brought up things that I didn't, I mean, I kind of don't care about what a bathroom looks like. And uh, and she does. And so part of that contract was me being just as strong to say, two days a week, we want your bathroom, you know, semi clean. Here's what we expect. And, uh, and then we handed her a bucket and it had like a toilet brush in it. And she's like, what's this? You know, because she grew up without somebody, somebody else was cleaning the toilet too. And I said, well, that's, that's your bucket. And you're, that's how you clean a toilet. In fact, I will come and show you how to clean the toilet. And, uh, you know, my friend Gary Chapman always says that if he would have known that that was, uh, that that was such an important thing to his wife, he would have been cleaning the toilet every day uh, to keep the marriage going instead of, uh, you know, not doing that at all. But that was, that's, that's a love language to somebody. So it was a love language for, to his wife. And so the same with, with, with Becca, it may not be a big deal to her. It may not be as big a deal to me, but it was a big deal to Kathy. And when she saw me come alongside her for that, that's important. Yeah. And that coming alongside and gosh, there's so much more I wanted to talk about, but could you just say like in the next quick minute legacy, that yeah. was so important in so many, that's a theme in so many of your books. Yeah. Well, you know what, with, um, with the empty nest and when you have doing life with your adult children, I mean, you're kind of too busy before that to even think much about legacy, finishing well, um, you know, living your life to the fullest, you know, what is it? But once you get your kids into the adult pool, so to speak, and when you go into the empty nest, you can begin to think about legacy. And that means how do you finish well? And with the whole idea of finishing well means how, how do you, what do you want your legacy to look like? 
And so I think now you can put more energy into that. So, you know, Kathy and I were at this uh, birthday party for our grandson yesterday. And I just sat back and I was so, I said to my daughter today, I am so proud of James and I'm so proud of you because every gift, our kids would open gifts and run on and forget to say thank you and all this. And every gift he, he stopped and said, thank you. And, and really acted like it was like such a treasure. And, uh, and I, I thought to myself, even as a grandpa now thinking about legacy that, you know, my relationship with my grandkids may be a greater legacy. And it's kind of a love affair between generations that I have so much I can give that kid. And so that means I need to put my energy in those kinds of things. And I can't do that if I'm living my life at too fast of a pace or if I'm overcommitted and underconnected uh, taking the time. I can't do that if I'm not spending time with God. You know, when people die, what are they interested in? Right relationship with God and a right relationship with their loved ones. We get so busy that, you know, it gets clouded in those things. I think as you begin looking at your legacy, that's when it's easier to declutter and say, no, I'm going to put energy into my my relationship, you know, the priorities, my relationship with God, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my kids, my relationship with my grandkids. And then, and, and I'll have plenty of time for my vocation as well. But I, I need to, in legacy, you're not giving your primary relationships your emotional scraps. Oh, that is so beautiful. And I could talk to you for hours and hours, but unfortunately our time is gone. Yep. So thank you so much for being here. It was such a oh, treat. My pleasure. And thanks for all that you're, you all are doing in San Antonio. It's really making a difference. I get the privilege to get there sometimes and speak and I hear about it. And, you know, making a difference in, in people's marriages is, uh, is massive. Um, so thank you. Well, and if you all want to connect with us at samarriage.org, that's where you'll find us and more about Jim and his resources. Yeah.